I thought I'd start by talking about stress just to follow up with Dr. Lupien, because I realized when I was watching her slides backstage how much I um, try to incorporate her practices, which was we got st my husband and I got stuck in the elevator yesterday at our hotel when we were supposed to be coming here. And um, it was stressful. We were there for about an hour. The fire department came, and um, it was rather exciting. But at one point, I turned to him and I said, I had my phone with me, which of course was very good, and I said, um, do you think we should meditate? And he said, no, in situations like this, he's a cardiologist, he said, I prefer to stay alert. <laughs> So, um, and then we got out of the elevator, and of course, we're very relieved, and I ran into my colleague, Mark Brackett, who's speaking after the break, and um, he, uh, I said to him, <laughs> he said, well, you know you can regulate. I was like, <laughs> okay. So, um, with that in mind, um, I'm actually uh, going to talk about relationships, uh, and particularly early relationships. Um, and uh, as Dr. Meany mentioned um, earlier, um, our, our window is so early and it's so important and so many things hinge on taking advantage of that early, early window. Um, so the child, that's actually me. Um, <laughs> my grandfather was an amateur photographer. Um, the child begins life open to relationships and ready for the world. And, you know, most babies come into the world ready for everything, and they're looking for people, and they're looking for experiences, and they're full of wonder. And it's really our job as parents to take full advantage of that, and as teachers. Um, and children are, are basically are born with a very basic set of needs. They need to feel safe. I'm going to keep coming back to the question of safety over and over again today. Because safety is not just physical safety. Safety is emotional safety. And safety is such a critical piece of what we have to offer children. And I think we're often unaware of how readily we can dis, you know, disrupt their sense of safety. They flourish in closeness. They need close relationships. They need um, us to be with them. And they find joy in autonomy. And one of the, um, one of the, so many of those of us working in this field, you know, look back to the earliest pioneers, you know, Mary Ainsworth, Barry Brazelton, in the ways they really made this balance that the safer you feel, the closer, you come more comfortable you are in closeness, the easier it is for you to reach out and explore the world. And if you don't feel safe, your explorations are thin. And if you don't, and if you, you know, and if you don't feel safe, um, you know, everything really flows uh, from that. So relationships with our nearest and dearest shape the kind of human being we will become. And of course, you know, uh, following Dr. Meany, I'm certainly well aware of the, you know, critical piece of genetics, but as his early work showed us, well, not so early, but recent, anyway, work showed us, the um, uh, environment and the relationships a person has profoundly in fact impact their neurobiology. And that is such a you know, really critical piece that your genetics are terribly important, um, but what happens in your early relationships and how the kind of person you are comes out of that. And the picture over there on the right is also me. And when I found this picture, which you know, I didn't see for many, many years, um, it reassured me because um, in fact, you know, my mother was a single parent she had a lot of, of difficulties um, when uh, I was first in the world. And yet, these are the moments that, you know, save you. These are the moments that take place even in the face of adversity. And, um, you know, I, I, I actually uh, credit those moments with some of my own uh, resilience. So, um, I love that picture. So, I'm going to be talking today about reflective functioning and mentalization, which are two words that um, are very um, awful. And uh, they're, they're sort of, they sort of defy real communication. And I've spent many years trying to figure out other words for it. But um, they actually refer to something very, very important. Um, and we, we all come into the world, ideally, um, ready to understand other people, in, you know, engaged in others' minds. And we are disengaged with others' minds for a variety of reasons. But reflective functioning refers to the capacity and interest in envisioning the mind of the other, envisioning what's going on, particularly the parent's willingness to envision and be, uh, imagine what's going on in the mind of the child. And once a parent kind of opens themselves up to the mind of the child, which we hope they will do you know, from the beginning, um, 
the child begins to know himself in the process of the parents discovering the child. So for instance, you know, a, a, a child is, um, let's take a 17 month old, just coming home from daycare, mom decides to stop at the grocery store, and the child is like any self-respecting 17 month old, you are really kidding me. <laughs> We're going shopping now, I'm hungry, I'm tired, I wanna go home. And you know, the mother's job is to provide dinner for the family, and she's probably been working all day too. Um, so she's, you know, the, the reflective mother is gonna say, okay, He's tired, he's hungry, he doesn't want to be here, so I'm going to address those needs. Okay, honey, it's just going to take a little while. Let me put you in the cart. You know, let me give you something to chew on. You know, let me give you something to eat, a juice box. And okay, you can hang on to that can of beans, and we'll just keep going through the store. And that regulates him. She regulates him with her touch. She regulates him with her eyes. She regulates him with her voice. But she's doing all of that on the basis of imagining what he's feeling, imagining what he's thinking. And so she... But then also what she does is she gives that child an experience that if I'm upset, it can be regulated. It can be named, it can be handled, it can be contained. And this takes place from the earliest days of life. And that also gives the child a sense that, you know, mommy knows I'm distressed, but it, it's, it's manageable. And that in contrast to a mother who, who, you know, like, let's say, you know, none of us ever do this, but, um, you know, now just stop it. You know, just cut it out. You are going to just sit in that cart and you're going to behave yourself until we get out of here. And the child, you know, automatically that's going to send the child's stress system, you know, nice and high. But it also has the effect of making the mother more stressed because immediately he's fighting her, he's not getting in the cart, he's arguing, he's wanting to grab things off the shelf. And you all know what this looks like by the time you get to the checkout, which is that the child is arched back, you know, mom is humiliated. Um, and and the child has not been regulated, and they're both of their stress levels at this point are very high. And I'll never forget being behind a, a, a little girl and her dad um, at the checkout at a, a drugstore, and um, he says, um, she says, Daddy, can I have candy? And he says, no. And she says, well, Mommy lets me have candy. And he said, well, I'm your father. <laughs> so. Okay, so in the parent, it's a stance of curiosity and wonder and imagining. It's the parent who can see, hear, and come to know the child. And then they, as a function of that, they're able to respond sensitively. And the child comes to know the contours of their inner life and their emotional life. And what, you know, you're happy, you're sad, you're angry, you hate this. You know, all of these are conveyed through the mother's facial expressions, but it makes the child's inner world known. And I figured since I was in Hollywood, I should you know, refer to the, the, our, our greatest actress of our era, Meryl Streep, who's a good mentalizer. I'm curious about people. That's the essence of my acting. I'm interested in what it would be like to be you. And of course, that's what we, you know, hope parents will um, be experiencing in relation to their children. But of course, you know, so many of us in our work as interveners, and you know, I'm gonna talk about work with a very vulnerable population, but I wanna also make it clear that this is um, not, not just about high levels of vulnerability, but that it's something that parents across, you know, all kinds of spectrums can be, uh, struggle with. So less reflective parents. I miss, overlook, or deny that you have thoughts and feelings. I don't, I just move ahead ignoring the signs that you have feelings. And there are always signs, you know, it's manifest in the child's behaviors. The other more colonizing experience a parent can have, I know what you're thinking and feeling. Which, oh, you know, for those of you who's ever been uh, talking to somebody who says they know what you're feeling, how obliterating that is, that just takes away your uh, experience. I assume our thoughts and feelings are the same. Um, when I uh, first called my mother from college and said I was going to be going into therapy, um, she said, um, why? I was in therapy. <laughs> so, um, anyway, you see I come by this honestly. Um, I take your behavior at face value, which is to say that the way you behave defines you, not what might be causing the behavior. So if you're tantruming, you're bad, right? There's no effort to understand. I distort your subjective experience. This is a more kind of subtle and very alienating experience when um, the parent um, you know, says, I know what you really mean. I know what you're really trying to say. When the child is unknown to the parent, I mean, or unknown to any uh, relational partner, when a person is unknown to another partner, 
then anything goes. Violence becomes possible, maltreatment is becomes possible because you kind of erase that person. And if you don't see their fear and you don't see their anxiety and you don't see their sadness, um, it's possible. Uh, and, and of course, you know, acts of violence kind of depend on that. So what causes parents to have struggles to reflect? A history of disrupted relationships. This can, you know, happen, uh, we're talking usually about atta disrupted attachment relationships, but all kinds of early relational disruptions cause this. Histories of trauma, um, certainly, you know, there's um, evidence, you know, both from the work of Peter Fonagy and, and Carl and Lyons Ruth, and um, uh, that the, that early trauma really uh, pre makes it much harder for you to reflect, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Socioeconomic risk, poverty, toxic stress, all of these make it much harder to be present and able to contemplate the mind of the other, to put yourself in the shoes of the other. When you're worrying about where your next meal is gonna come from, or you're worrying about your child's physical safety, this is a luxury. Right? And one of the things that you know, we try to do in our work is create those moments. Um, I think of it as parenting in survival mode. Um, you get triggered, you stop attending to the child, you can't attend to the child. The parent then for the child becomes a source of fear. And I'm, I'm gonna uh, pick up on um, some of what Dr. Meany said before and I'm, uh, what Dr. Lupian was speaking about as well which is that it's so important when we think about working with parents and young children to attend to threat and to attend to fear. And when a parent is frightening to the child or frightened by the child, where they become, aware, uh, they become overwhelmed and they sort of faint back away from the child, um, this is, is really a serious um, consequence for the child because remember the child looks to the parent or the caregiver or a grandmother or an aunt or an uncle as someone they can rely on, that they can go to for safety. And when the parent becomes a source of fear, it's, it's really terribly uh, problematic. So we tend to think about, we, we're all in love with the ACEs, you know, the Adverse Childhood Experience Questionnaire, um, with really talking about childhood adversi adversity. But what happens in childhood adversity is your fear system is chronically aroused. You, and rather than being safe, you feel fearful. So you feel controlled, afraid, unknown, alone, as if your mind has been taken over. It curtails your ability to think and explore and go out in the world. And all of your energy goes to maintaining the relationship because we must never forget that the child's relationship is what he has. That is what's keeping him alive. His survival depends on his maintaining that relationship. And of course, this leads to disrupted affect re regulation. And I just want to show this slide, um, which I, I love, which shows really the poles we all go to, you know, we either shut down and become hyper-regulated and under-aroused or when we can become completely over-aroused and dysregulated as I was when I got out of the elevator. Um, and the goal is to keep, for the parent to keep the child, for the therapist to keep the patient, for the teacher to keep the student in that safe mentalizing space where they can be regulated and authentic and reflective and out of fight-flight or worse, free freezing modes. Um, so the child in, in survival mode has elevated stress hormones, they have disrupted socio-emotional development, which we know has long-term um, outcomes for their uh, academic and life success. They have fragmented attention, disorientation, behavioral disorganization, and as you were talking about also, long-term implications for the direct development of the prefrontal cortex, because their amygdala has been telling them for, you know, forever that um, they've got to pay attention and not in a good way. And Steve Porges does this wonderful work where he talks about the difference between being open and being threatened and your whole body posture changes and your eye, uh, eye gaze changes when you're stressed. And of course there are long-term health and um, uh, mental health outcomes. And parents who are reflective, we found in our research, are more likely to have securely attached children, more likely to respond sensitively, more likely themselves to be securely attached, and very importantly, less likely to behave in frightening or frightened ways with their child. So this is a real beneficial thing to um, have uh, in your, I don't want to call it a toolkit because I really hate that word, um, but you know, to have as a capacity. and. The more difficult your own life experiences have been, the more challenging this is going to do, be for you. So one of the things that we do is we work very hard to promote reflective functioning in families at risk who have high ACEs. And I just want to say that this is not unique to our intervention. 
You know, when you read the work of Alicia Lieberman, who's been so instrumental in this area, if you read the work of the Circle of Security, if you read the work of Carl and Lyons Ruth, they're all talking about getting at this capacity to attend to the child in a very profound way. So you, it's very important to intervene early when parental and baby brains are ready for new relationships. It's crucial to disrupt intergenerational patterns and to limiting the time we spend in survival mode. And we can all define survival mode in ourselves. I mean, it's not uh, a challenging concept to grasp. So minding the baby, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about minding the baby. Um, it's an interdisciplinary home vis visiting program. We start in pregnancy, which is really terribly important. Um, you'll find that so, there's just, relative to the amount of attention there is to early childhood, there, there's almost no attention to pregnancy. And if you look at it from a neuroscientific point of view, it is absolutely a critical period. So we start in pregnancy and we follow the babies through until they're two. And we're following, and some, to some extent, the nurse-family partnership model, which was one of our inspirations. And we have a nurse and a social worker. And the point of having both disciplines is that body and mind are connected. And many people who have, uh, you know, really trauma histories have a terrible time taking care of their own bodies, have a terrible time responding to what's going on with their children's bodies, and we work a lot on reflective health, developmental, and parenting support. And um, we use relationships to harness protective factors. That is, the relationship with the clinicians who are in the home with them every week for the first 17 months and then every other week for the next, is so important and having a capacity to relate is a crucial thing in a clinician. I don't think we talk about that enough um, because um, that's what makes the change in, in my view. So um, our sample is a, is a high risk sample with you know not, most not having graduated from high school, predominantly Latina. Many of the moms we saw in our initial sample had, had been in child protection themselves. Many of them were teenagers. Uh, our mean age was 19. And we found that when we came into this group, they were, they had high, they came in, mothers came in with low levels of reflective capacity when they were, they were in pregnancy. They had high levels of adverse childhood experiences. And what we found is that our intervention, which again is very intensive, our moms at the end had significantly higher levels of reflective functioning. Their children were more likely to be secure, which as you know, many of you know, is a real perfective factor going into later development. It's a resiliency factor. And lower levels of disorganized attachment, which has such a profound effect on later development and um, particularly later mental health problems. And we also found, and this is the work of Monica Ordway, of significantly lowers of lower levels of obesity in the toddlers um, who graduated from minding the baby and significantly higher levels of um, normal weight. And we work a lot on nutrition and just getting them to attend to the baby's cues. You know, hunger uh, is mediated through, verb, uh, through behavior or cueing. And if you're not listening and you're not watching, you know, food, as we all know, I mean, you talked about cheeseburgers. I mean, let's talk about a hot fudge sundae. Um, <laughs> you know, life uh, relationships are, are um, mediated through cues, and food can become a very um, destructive, you know, part of <laughs> relationships. Um, all right. Um, we had lower rates of child protection referral. We had, we found that mothers who had, this is a small uh, study done uh, by Madeline Terry in, the, in our UK sample, that mothers who had hostile and helpless representations of their babies and of themselves as caregivers were, had a very high likelihood, 86% likelihood of having their child removed. Um, and, and those who didn't had an 86% likelihood of not having their child removed. We had significantly lower rates of rapid, childhood, uh, rapid child subsequent, subsequent childbearing, which is a very uh, problematic public health outcome. And um, we had significantly fewer externalizing behaviors at one and three year follow up. And again, this was a very vulnerable, um, high risk sample. And we are doing longitudinal studies as we speak, um, looking at biomarkers of stress, health, and mental health outcomes um, in these uh, kids as they grow up. And we have replications in uh, the United States and Scotland and, and uh, England and Denmark. So I'm going to spend the time I have remaining um, talking about this as an approach rather than specifically about mining the baby because mining the baby, like so many of, of so much of what we do in our field, is only one way of approaching the issue. And the issue is 
reflected so beautifully in this quote from another Yaley who um, is long gone, but she was one of the uh, founders of the Child Study Center, great teacher and child psychiatrist. She used to say to parents, don't just do something, stand there and pay attention. Your child is trying to tell you something. And we find, you know, I mean, I don't have to tell you, that there's so much focus on control and on doing and not enough on just paying attention, just quieting down and pay attention. And I, you can play with this um, saying any number of ways. You can substitute the mother so that when you're, when you're an intervener, don't just do something, don't just stick with your curriculum, which is guiding, pay attention, the mother is trying to tell you something, right? That that is such a, a, an important thing for interveners who in very complex family situations are overwhelmed with stress themselves. You know, it may not be a particularly dangerous, it may not be a particularly safe environment, it may be a frightening environment, there may be a lot going on. And you know, the, so the clinician has to regulate her stress. And interestingly, you go back to that threat slide that I showed you before. When clinicians are activated and threatened and scared, um, they can often themselves shut down, which may throw the mom into hyper ar you know, arousal. So all kinds of things, things happen in relation to the clinician's um, level of stress. So the reflective approach is very simple. It's from stop to why, right? And if you think of that within the framework, and I, I know Mark Brackett is going to be talking about this really very much more fully in a little bit, but stop be doing your misbehave, you know, stop misbehaving. Let me see to control you, but instead of that, to really um, bring about curiosity from reactivity to curiosity about emotional causes and meanings. And this really allows you to modulate fear and engage thinking and empathy which are the critical elements of relationships. And um, our healthcare system, you know, I, I don't need to tell you either that the healthcare system has become so behavioral and so checklist oriented that to actually get a doctor to in fact listen to you can be challenging depending on where you get your healthcare and you know what your socioeconomic status is, et cetera. Um, these are um, really, it's not the way healthcare is delivered. And certainly it's not the way education is delivered. You know, let's, you know, um, get kids to behave so we can teach them. Well, the idea is if they can't, if we can't teach them, it's probably because of something they're experiencing. And if we don't address those things, they're, you know, really not gonna change. So um, I just sort of um, wanted to talk a little bit about what this approach looks like, just at a very simple le level. It starts with a relationship. Two people, eye to eye, listening to each other. Slow it down. You know, we're often in such, you know, I think, Dr. Lupin, you spoke about this so beautifully. You know, to slow it down, pause, take a breath. I was standing back there taking a deep breath. You know, these are really important things. You then identify the developmental concern, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a, a clinician, whether um, you're a parent. What's going on? What's going on developmentally? Be curious, be open. You know, um, this is not a stance that's necessarily part of what, the way we teach uh, teachers to be. And then, or parents certainly, how do you think your child feels and what is that like for you to attend to both sides of the process? Community, social, and cultural systems can be in survival mode too. You might have noticed this recently. Um, with a big emphasis on fear, control, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I did these slides like a couple of weeks ago, and it feels like every day that goes by, you know, the, fear, the need for fear and control of other people's efforts to control us um, are, are really exaggerated. Um, we're trying to build reflective communities, and there's a very big reflective parenting community here in L.A., um, and we're building reflective communities, one baby, one family at a time, hoping for downstream impacts at the relational, biological, and community level. And I found this wonderful quote by Jane Goodall, only if we understand will we care, only if we care will we help, and only if we help shall we all be saved. Thank you.